This is Defenders TV Podcast, episode 83, where we are looking at Luke Cage, episode 9, Dwick. You think I'm holding back? Welcome back, Defenders, to this episode of Luke Cage, episode 9, where we are looking at D-W-Y-C-K, or Dwick. Um, we're not entirely sure, but I think there's a lot of history behind these uh, five letters. Uh, this is Defenders TV Podcast, episode 83, and I am one of your hosts, John. There's a lot of history behind our podcast now. 83 episodes in, guys. Did you imagine that in a year and a half? Yeah, it's kind of... Are we wasting our time? Is anyone there? Are we just talking <laughs> yeah, to space? Are you listening? Are you low? No, of we, course. Thank you so much. Yes, we know there is. We know there is because they come over and join us on their Facebook group over yes. on facebook.com slash groups slash Defenders TV Podcast. They join us over on Twitter at Defenders Cast and occasionally... Send in feedback to feedback at DefendersTVPodcast.com. Did you like how I worked that in? Absolutely. Obviously, I am also one of your hosts. And my name is Derek. And rounding out the group, I'm Chris. I randomly shout things from the back. <laughs> we, we are the three Dwicks. <laughs> <laughs> Should we get into that now? One of my points every week is usually what the song means and what the connection of the Gangstar song is to the title of the episode. This episode's called Dwick after the Gangstar song. Uh, should we get into what it's called? I stage? think we should, because in opening up the podcast, I was like, do I just go D-W-Y-C-K, or do I go Dwick? And of course, when I started to think about that, I went, Dwick sounds a rather like D- I love that we still have our swear jar in play. Yes, uh, I did look up, trying to find out, what is the meaning of Dwick? Uh, great little interview with Guru, who is one of the uh, lead singers, I guess, or writers for uh, for Gangstar, uh, where he's interviewed and the question he's asked is, on the internet they say, D-W-Y-C-K means do what you can, kid. And his response is, that's a great meaning. I wish that was the actual meaning for it. <laughs> it's just a term we used to express our uh, jokingly calling our male genitalia dwick, is what he says. So, yes, it is d- We'll leave that silence hanging there. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, there we go. But there is a connection to the episode, a really good one that, uh, that Chris found. I'm going to give him credit for this one, but I'm going to take Woo! it. As, I'm going to take it as my own point, of course. Uh, so, so it is the moments where, um, Simone Missix, Misty Knight is sitting, sitting opposite, uh, the interrogator, I guess, or the psychologist, uh, in the interrogation room. He brings her in a drink, which is a can of lemonade hands it over to her and says, uh, lemonade's a popular drink, and she goes, it still is. That line is directly taken from the song Dwick by Gangstar. So that's the connection. Basically. That's fantastic. And there's also the other big connection in the fact that we don't see Luke Cage's Dwick uh, at the end of the episode. He's clearly naked, and it's covered up. So that's obviously the other connection for the episode. You, actually, that is true. It was there with a big metal plate over mm-hmm. it. Well, maybe it's that's melded to him now because of the acid. Maybe. But we get ahead of ourselves. Yes. Absolutely. In <laughs> fact, we are absolutely upside down, back to front and topsy-turvy. Because normally we would go into our five points, but we, we've kind of done one earlier, a bit off track. It's obviously coming into strange season because uh, we're all going, ooh, bending reality and time right. around the podcast. So that I'm sure we'll be starting with our last points first, and our first point shall be last, as the Bible once said. Or, or as Diamondback once said. Or as Diamondback once said. Yeah, but if you are new to the podcast, we're not normally this crazy at the start. Or are we? Maybe we are. We go through our five points for good, for bad, or for indifferent of the, each episode of Luke Cage. And at the end, we just say whether we defend or not this episode of Luke Cage. And of course, in addition to all the uh, places where you can come and join us to discuss, comment, and give feedback on each episode of Luke Cage or the series as a whole or on the podcast, you can also send feedback in directly to feedback at DefendersTVPodcast.com or leave a 90-second voicemail. You know you want to. We and our listeners would like to listen to the dulcet tones of one of our listeners. 
providing comments and some discussion. So go on, you know you want to. But I think without further ado, Derek, what are some of the production details for, for this episode? Well, this episode was directed by Tom Shankland, uh, another British director uh, for the show. He has done shows like The Leftovers. He did three episodes of House of Cards. And here's his Marvel connection. Uh, he worked on the show The Fades, which starred Ian DeCastiger from oh, Marvel's very good. Shield. Oh, yes. Terrible show. Great actor. Excellent show. Really enjoyed it. <laughs> no. Sorry, dude. <laughs> this is where we'll diverge. It's a, it's Three. a great show. I was pitied it didn't get a second season because it did set up itself for a second season. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually talked to Ian, Ian DeCastiger as, uh, when I met him at the uh, Star Fury convention of Ed Fades, hoping that, uh, saying that I, the only reason I didn't enjoy the success of S.H.I.E.L.D. is that he can't come back and make season two and cover off the uh, the cliffhanger that was left at the end of season one. And he's like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a much more successful show. Like, I'm earning yeah. lots more money. I'm sorry. <laughs> he, was, he was quite polite about it, I must say. <laughs> and the episode was written by Christian Taylor, who's written a TV show called I Candy, which I haven't seen, but he did write 15 episodes of Star Wars The Clone Wars. Uh, he wrote an episode of Lost. And wrote three episodes of one of your favourite shows, John, Six Feet Under. Sweet, sweet, sweet Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> um, or sweet, sweet, sweet Six Feet Under. Definitely. Just to mix it up even further, that might explain why uh, the Luke Cage acid bath did look like something out of Star Wars, maybe. It did look like... Darth Vader was going to stand up and go, no. Oh, no. Or, um, you know, the, it was the kind of carbonite, uh, the encasing of Han Solo and mm-hmm. carbonite. It, it, just with the lights, the bubbles, the atmosphere. I got that too. Yeah, it that really feeling. had a sense of Star Warsiness about it yeah. for me. Yeah, that must have been Christian Taylor's work on Clone Wars then. Yeah. I was just expecting the thumb to come out and it'd be like, I love you. I know. <laughs> Terminator 2. Nice, nice. <laughs> Another Terminator 2 reference this yeah. week. Yes, so many references. But, John, do you want to tell us what they gave us in this episode with your synopsis? Sure. After his second bullet wound at the hands of Willis Stryker, Luke Cage's wounds begin to turn septic. As he reunites with Claire Temple, they become increasingly desperate to find a way of removing the Judas bullet shrapnel. And in so doing, they head back down south to Georgia and Dr. Noah Bernstein as Luke begins to weaken. Elsewhere in Harlem, in the vacuum of Cornell Stokes' murder, an uneasy alliance forms between Mariah, Shades and Diamondback. At a meeting of the local crime bosses, Diamondback kills all of them except Domingo Colon and only spurs Mariah Dillard after she proves her worth. Misty Knight is hauled in front of a police psychologist who evaluates her breakdown on the job. As Knight is released and tasked to find Luke Cage, he arrives at Bernstein's house where, using Reaver's data stick from Cage's chain, Bernstein hopes to try and remove the bullet fragments. As he lowers Luke Cage into a boiling tank of acid, the pain becomes too much as the ECG flatlines. Beep! Wow. Another death of Luke Cage, or another injury. He's gone from indestructible, unbreakable to an out-and-out wuss at this stage. <laughs> I mean, he's like getting, he's getting shot here, shot there, mm-hmm. um, melted here, m- melt- melted there. <laughs> exactly. Um, like the, the idea of having a nice acid bath. I mean, it must be great for the complexion, but dreadful <laughs> if it goes a bit too far. Definitely. I don't know whether he's a wuss because they made a great touch in this and. Again, listeners, we're starting at the end of the episode because it's the third episode in a row where Luke is uh, is dead, effectively, at the end of the episode. Uh, or injured, at least. Yeah. yeah. In this, this case, particular it's, one, it's kind of it's dead. Lines, yeah. right? But they may have a great little touch there where, uh, where uh, Claire tells him beforehand, if the pain gets too much for you, make a fist and I'll stop the procedure immediately. And just after he flatlines, the last thing he does with his hand is make a fist. So only death is too painful for Luke Cage, effectively. So uh, I like that touch. Yeah, cool cool little touch, cool little touch. But with that, Derek, what is your first point? My first point is the relationship between Will Stryker and Shades. This was pretty unexpected, because we haven't really seen the two of them together in the entire season so far. We've only seen Shades uh, dealing with, with Cottonmouth a couple of times. Um, and talking about Diamondback, so we've never really seen the two of them interact together. 
I was really surprised at the disdain that Shade seems to have for him. He's respectful of him as, as his boss, but you can tell a few times that he's kind of going, I really wouldn't have handled it this way. And Diamondback also, the first thing he does with Shades is point a gun at his head uh, to make to shoot him. So he's only saved by Zip coming into the room and making a case for his life. Yeah, basically. I mean, this is a really uh, interesting little turnaround or twist or something, which Diamondback blames uh, Alvarez Shades for the death of Cottonmouth. You know, Ultimately, it was on his watch. Mm -hmm. Maybe he believes the cooked-up tale that Shades and Mariah have, or whether he knows the truth. Because there's that great moment where, you know, he does question that story that has been said Mm -hmm. uh, by Shades uh, as to what happened to Cottonmouth. So um, this is a really interesting little development um, because, yeah, he has the gun to his head and... It's one that's kind of slightly unexpected. And I mean, I'm, I'm calling it a nice little twist, but I'm wondering if a little bit more kind of, uh, background or a little bit of signposting to say that maybe their relationship wasn't quite as solid in terms of, you know, right hand man, yeah. uh, to Diamondback than, than we had previously thought. It, it may have been useful. Yeah. Um, it certainly would have put, the death of Cottonmouth Stokes um, at the hands of Mariah and the cover-up by Shades into a different perspective. Yeah, It's certainly, at this moment in time, uh, Diamondback purely thinks that Shades was trying to make a play to own the club uh, and to effectively kind of start his own little kingdom, yeah. crime kingdom on his own. But, um, you know, it, it's a nice development. I actually do really like it. But it, I think it would have been nice just to have had something um, signposted maybe a couple of episodes earlier or something. Even if ultimately it was that a few times where Shades did sort of kind of the stir down or, or the reprimand of Cottonmouth, that possibly it was Willis Stryker. Yeah. That they had come in and done that. And maybe that there was, you know, some kind of explanation which showed that, okay, Diamondback actually really liked Cottonmouth because despite some of his flaws, he got the job of selling guns done uh, and the money made. Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe that there was a tenser relationship with Shays could have come out from that as well. Yeah, Yeah, I agreed. um, Definitely a nice little twist, I thought, but um, But unexpected. Yeah, Yeah, a surprise. surprise, And the fact that Diamondback calls out immediately when he comes in that uh, what what are you doing getting Mariah to do your dirty work? So he clearly knew that Shades didn't want uh, Cottonmouth in the picture. He's been he's been making a play for Cottonmouth for a while. That's what it seems like from Diamondback's point of view. So that was quite interesting that he's kind of known that this was on the plate, but has called off maybe maybe called off Shades a couple of times from doing anything about it. And now he's pushed Mariah to do the killing. Basically, is what the Diamondback is saying to him. But the thing is, Shades is still pretty much an enigma mm-hmm. from a character development point of view. Definitely, yeah. Us. Yeah. All we know, he was in jail. Yeah. We know he knew Luke, or Carl Lucas, sorry. He then somehow joined up with Diamondback. Mm-hmm. We know... Or or was with Diamondback before he went into prison. True, yep, yep, that, that could be another possibility. Mm-hmm. But we never knew that Luke wouldn't have known him back then. Because yeah. he would have known him then in prison, but he didn't know him in prison. Yeah. So, we, we don't know how that works, but okay, yeah. yes, I... I, 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 I bow to your wisdom on that one. It no, may, no. Cause, it cause, may be. No, because Stryker did say that everything that happened to Luke in prison was at his hand and by his will. So, um, okay, so that's, yeah. that's why I thought that Shays already worked for him when Carl Lucas met him. Yeah. But for me, one of the things, I think Theo Rossi's playing the character of Shades as a character who has an ace up his sleeves mm-hmm. and he's just not showing it yet. Yeah. He has a secret. He's not telling Definitely. someone. Definitely. Is he powered? Maybe, maybe not now. I don't know. Uh, my theory of that he was powered, maybe it's just a good stare down he's, he's really good at. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think he may be powered now, but I'd love to be wrong. Um, or maybe he's just hiding, hiding his eyes behind the shades just because he doesn't want to see his boss 
see him roll his eyes at some of the actions <laughs> that he makes where he's just like, like, oh no, please don't shoot another person in the head. I oh, know, don't don't knife them. Don't. <laughs> but he's able to keep his whole face straight, but yeah. the eyes would just give him just away. Just rolling, you know? rolling. <laughs> but no, I think it's a he's a great character and it's just I've said it once, I've said it in the last episode, would have loved a bit more exposition on Diamondback. Mm-hmm. And I think this also relates, as John said, to the, the the relationship between the two. I think that, again, it would have been more impactful if this was played out slightly longer. Mm-hmm. Because now it just has us chasing our tail, kind of asking, oh, what? oh I, but I thought... They were best friends, or they were right hand man. Mm-hmm. Okay, yes, it, but it sets shades up as a liar now. So, is he playing Mariah? Was he playing Diamondback? Was he playing Cottonmouth? Like, who, whose side is who? Who's he working for? What was his plan? Yeah. Like, was he trying to get Cottonmouth's empire and then Diamondback copped on? Yeah. Or is this been a plan of Diamondback all along to put Mariah in place to get this around? Mm-hmm. Like, it's just there's too many potential threads to kind of... I, I, I don't like it signposted. I, I agree. So a certain signposts would have been great, but I think now there's we're in the middle of a crossroads and we don't know which avenue to take. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think hopefully they will explain this a bit more. Again, like, just who is Shades? Yeah. Why is he there? That kind of thing. That will give us a bit of background. It almost feels like we need another flashback, actually. Yes, yes. Um, I don't know whether we're going to get that, but it does feel like um, one of the episodes from here on in to the, to the end of the series does actually need to be a flashback mm-hmm. to to bring some of these together. Or um, it, it certainly needs to be explained o- o- over the course of the next few episodes, yeah. definitely. I'd like to see a flashback to Willis Stryker and Carl Lucas when they were younger, see the two of them working together so we get a little bit of background I think it's going to happen. I think that's exactly what's going to happen maybe in the next episode or the episode after. And we did see both names in the credits for one of the episodes that those characters weren't in. So so I'm presuming we will see a young Carl Lucas and a young uh, Willis Stryker in a future episode. Possibly the next episode called Take It Personal. It's very likely that Willis Stryker has taken something personal. So that's, that title alone is telling me there's a possibility that's where the flashbacks come from. Absolutely. Um, but I, that was certainly one of uh, my points as well was that... Um, about Shades and, and Diamondback's relationship being mm-hmm. more fraught, definitely. But Chris, what's your first point? So I'm going to redact part of my statement on Diamondback in the last episode. Okay. Now, I'm not fully redacting it. Okay. I'm not fully saying, no, I, I wholeheartedly support this villain. No, but... I can redact it. I can edit it out of the podcast so nobody will ever have heard it. No, it's okay. No, I would. <laughs> no, because we like we like to show my foibles. This was a good introduction to Diamondback, mm-hmm. this episode. Yes. This is where we saw, rather than the Cesar Romero, Jack Nicholson uh, type of Joker villain, crazy, unhinged, that we saw in the last uh, episode, mm-hmm. this is the Heath Ledger villain. Right. This is the... He's sadistic, he's slightly crazy, Mm -hmm. he's violent. Yes. That I can understand. That is a character who fits in with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Mm -hmm. And he even does a trick. It's not a card trick, but he even does a trick with with the gun at the start with uh, with one of Zip's guys, uh, where he takes his fingers out of his jacket, points the fingers at him and shoots him with a gun in his other hand. Which I thought was cool. I saw the gun when he was walking into the room, unfortunately, so it was kind of given away. No, I but, didn't. Uh, but I did like the uh, the idea of it, where he's yeah, you, know, you think he shot someone with his fingers. That's quite fun. Yeah, I, I didn't actually see the gun, so I was like, <laughs> <laughs> he's got powers. Yeah, he's got powers yeah. <laughs> I was like, yay! Someone else is gonna no, no, because <laughs> yeah, not... he would have used it in a fight previously. Yeah, yeah. I definitely I saw the gun as well. Um, yeah, this is a, another one of my points. Just. I think Diamondback in this episode, again, it's seeing more of this character on screen and seeing who he is and what he does. And I mean, that, that moment in the club, in the office was just superb. You know, the whole idea of the 48 laws of power. Um, he's kind of, the, the, there's that callback to when Cottonmouth w- was, was um, underneath the, the, the picture of B.I.G. Mm-hmm. It, it's slightly different. It's a slightly different perspective. 
but that the same thing happens um, where you get the crown going uh, on top of his head, yeah. uh, which was really, really good. You know, he he certainly pulls no punches. He's sort of, you know, this this is where he threatens um, Shades with the gun after basically saying the 49th law of power is he's not dead, I, Luke Cage, until I have his boss here, yeah. basically. Yeah. Like, really, really good. That's kind of a law for Marvel. I've heard actually a lot of people talk about Marvel comic books like that, where if you don't see the body, they're not dead. And, and Marvel movies, because people come back to life all the time in comic books. Yep. And it's always one of those. Unless there's a funeral, they're they're not coming back. From and the even dead. if and there's even then, a funeral. And <laughs> even then, there's only two characters in the Marvel Universe, I think, that have never come back. Uncle Ben and uh, Goliath. The other two. And Goliath's, oh, Goliath's never come back as well. Yeah. That's right. Which, pretty sure... I'm sure they're, they're all coming back very yeah. <laughs> But Uncle Ben always gets resurrected um, in the billionth retelling of the Spider-Man origin. That's true. That's true, yes. There's always an Uncle Ben in the Spider-Man yeah. movies, isn't there? He's actually Uncle Anthony now. Or ah. like Uncle Tony. <laughs> Uncle Tony Stark, of course. <laughs> yes. yes, very true. Yep. John, do you want to give us your next point? Yeah, it's the uh, the Misty Knight deconstruction, the interview with her by Dr. Gabe Kasner, um, who's played here by John Skirty, who was in Rescue Me, which I loved. I loved that show. And I loved um, him particularly in that show. Yeah. He just played so well off Dennis Leary. Just a great character. Yeah, well, he was Lou, um, Ken, Lou, Shea. And, yeah, I, I loved him in Rescue Me. Um, yeah, he, as you say, he played off Dennis Leary really well. Mm. And pr- really good sort of sense of humor within that show. And here he plays a, a really different kind of character and I really enjoyed it Um I, I love the fact that you know uh, he comes out with you're already broken to, to Misty Knight she thinks she can battle this off and, yeah. and, and sort of hard nose him and really put up the, the shutters and, and really you know fight it but he he, he he challenges her to say, like, you're already broken. The question is, how broken are you? And can you be fixed? Yeah. You know, he uses different things against her. Like, he uses the basketball analogy of, you know, why bench yourself mm-hmm. at, at this stage? He talks about things and hands her the, the, the photograph to ask her and talks about losing control. You know, he knows that she wants to be in control and it, it, it breaks her ultimately. You know, he talks about career suicide. I loved this. I thought it was a really excellent little piece within this episode, which was just interspersed, showing the vulnerability of, of Misty Knight, who doesn't want to show any of that at the hands of this psychologist. Yeah. And I just thought this was a really good deconstruction of, of, of this character in this interview. Ultimately, Priscilla, you know, she is, because she owns up that she lost control, she is given her badge back, she Mm -hmm. is given her gun, and told to effectively go and track down and bring back uh, Luke Cage. Even though she's still fighting it, and I love that about Misty Knight, she's still saying, but what about Mariah? Yeah. You know, she's still out there. Um, she's still... What about the guy who pointed a gun at my head? Yeah, yeah. exactly. She's yeah. still fighting. She's still being Misty Knight. She's still not wanting to leave any threat uh, loose, ultimately. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I just thought this this whole um, interview sequence was really good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I like that it all ended with Misty back with her wall, takes down all the pictures from the wall except for Cornell Stokes, the guy with the gun who she doesn't know as well as Stryker. Mariah and Luke Cage. They're her four people that she is going to be following up on, regardless of if she's told exactly. it's going to be Luke Cage, that, that she has to go after him. She knows these four people are connected in some way. Yeah, but again, they're kind of, after literally just being given her badge back and mm-hmm. told, go do this one thing. Yeah. She does the exact opposite. Well, yeah. <laughs> she's like, I'm going to do this one thing, plus these three others at the same time. Don't exactly. worry, it won't matter. Yeah. I agree with you. I love the scene as well. Um, the confession, the the very end, I was saying to you guys when we were wa- after we just finished watching it, it was a bit jarring the hard cuts and the editing, right? Just because I wasn't sure, I was expecting that this was all in her head, the mm-hmm. what she was saying, and then she was just going to say nothing or yeah. say something very aloof, but it was just no, she was actually saying them. It was just the hard cuts, 
made it look like different parts of her personality, right. etc. I, I get it That now. it could be a dream or something. Yeah. yeah. But it was just yeah. more, it, it felt to me, yeah, it was the dream. Then she was going to say something else. Yeah. Yeah, I know what yeah. you mean. I know what you mean. But again, a great moment for Simone Missick again. I've said it almost every episode because I just love this yeah, actress. Definitely. I love this character. But a great moment when she's saying, this man put a gun to my head about to take away everything that's important to me and laughed his whole way through it. That's why she's so angry. That's why she's so pissed. That's why she lost control. Um, excellent. Really well played. Really, really good scene. So, Derek, what's your next point? My next point is just that we finally get a bit more detail about Reva, about the thumb drive, all from Dr. Burstein, um, when they get to his house. I really like the idea that we were wrong about Reva's involvement in the creation of Luke Cage. I'd said one of the big changes from the comic book is that Luke goes into this program to try and knock some years off his time in prison. Uh, but this time, what they changed in the show was that it's all Reva's fault. If it hadn't been for her, he wouldn't have been pushed into the program. He wouldn't have been changed in the way he was. It's not actually correct. It looks like even without Reva, as Dr. Burston says, without her, it still would have happened. He was already earmarked. The reason he was effectively being uh, being groomed for it was because he's a strong person, which they'd seen from the fights uh, in uh, in the fight club, I suppose, underneath the prison. Um, they had already earmarked him for that. I thought that was really interesting that he that he would never have gotten out of this uh, situation. You know um, that Riva didn't push him into it, so she's not at fault here. She's, it's not her fault uh, that he is Luke Cage. Um, she did save his life, and it came a little bit earlier than expected. Uh, he may have just died if it wasn't for the security guard twisting the knobs up too high. He may have just died. But uh, but I like that we get a little bit of that extra story. And obviously then the thumb drive, which we talked about in the episode. If we didn't get an answer to that, I think you guys were saying, if you didn't get an answer to the thumb drive uh, and it being more important, then it would have ruined the, that episode for you. At least now we do know that this is, contains all the information that Burston uh, had lost in, in Seagate. He now can replicate some of the things he was doing. Uh, and it obviously contains all the rest of the stuff. And I like his reaction when he gets the thumb drive is, she died for this, didn't she? Because he knows the importance of what's on there. So we'll learn more, I'm sure, uh, now that he has the thumb drive available to him. Um, but I like that this thread is continuing uh, from from Jessica Jones and from the show. It was. It was um, from the flashback. I mean, that was one of the things I hoped that it would get further explained. And, and we have that here. I really, um, I enjoyed this, uh, seeing the, um, the use of, of, of this drive and, and Luke Cage actually being hugely protective over it. And um, like, there was part of me that wasn't entirely sure whether, you know, when, when him and Claire Temple were talking about, do you trust Burns, Burstein? Um, and they both kind of go, no. Uh, and Luke, you know, comes straight out and says, we'll kill him if you think you need to, in order to protect Reaver's hard drive. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of was like, oh, okay. I didn't expect it to be that absolute and sort of trial without jury type of thing. Right, right. I mean, I'm not too sure whether they're wrong about Burstein and, and whether he can be trusted. Mm. Uh, certainly now that after losing all his research, he suddenly got it back again. You know, you, you wouldn't know how that might um, affect him. But I, I, I was thinking... You know, it seemed in episode four that him and Reva actually were a good team. Yeah. And, and so I would have thought Luke Cage would have maybe recognized that and, and not necessarily say kill him. Yeah. You know, kill was, them all kind of. He got a bit kind of, but then he was about to get loaded into an acid bath. I well, yeah. True. true. Um, I was trying to think back on. Was it deep fried or was it rotisserie? I can't remember. Like deep fried like a turkey, apparently. That's yeah. the thing. Uh, we don't deep fry turkeys in Ireland. Nope. Um, I have heard about it in America, but I've never, uh, never experienced it, I must say. Um, but no, I was trying to think back on the episode and trying to see where the point was. What was it that Burston said to Luke that could have made him suspicious of him? And what he said is that, uh, we developed a lot of weapons for the army. We developed, um, we developed bulletproof equipment using the same technique that we used on you. So I think just the infer- inference there from Luke is that, uh, if he gets this technology in his hands again, he will develop an army of Luke Cages, which will be unstoppable. Uh, Luke says, I don't want one of me on every corner of every street. 
So, yeah. so I think that's the inference. I think it's just, it's kind of, it's almost a dropped line in, in amongst some of the explanation and other exposition that's going on during that scene. But I think that's the line that, that Luke is, uh, that react turns Luke, that turn, makes Luke react, or at least makes, uh, makes Claire react to him. So I think that's the one. Yeah. And I, what I found interesting was, uh, the, the complete change. This has nothing to do with the Captain America formula anymore. Mm-hmm. So that's a, it's a unique change. Yeah. I assumed they were going to go down that. The Super Soldier Initiative has nothing to do here. Yeah. This is about building bulletproof humans mm-hmm. to a degree. And it was, they were weapons manufacturers and now they're to a degree doing the same thing, but with humans. Yeah. Yeah. yeah pretty um, much. Yeah. And it, uh, the one thing I'll put my hand down and say, they explained the powers better. Now, yes, I will say that now because we're on this topic. They explained it to my satisfaction Mm -hmm. now, and I think that's better. I think, again, this is the detriment of us not binge watching a binge themed show. Yes, yes, sorry, absolutely, sorry again, guys. It's okay, it's okay. (laughs) But I just wanted to wanted to redact my. This is they. How could they do this? Yes, and I was like, okay, well, thank you. We're normally so good at predicting yeah. stuff. <laughs> we are awful at predicting stuff. Absolutely awful at predicting it. But we don't, it doesn't stop us, which, no. is, which is good. Uh, no, I, I, I agree with you, Chris. I think when you're looking back on episode, uh, episode eight, where Claire is trying to explain what's happening to Luke, again, you understand she's not actually there. She doesn't know where everything came from. She's trying to pick it up from the little bits and pieces she's um, investigating, I suppose. And then you meet the character who is actually involved in all of the experiments. So, of course, he'll give a, he knows what happened. He knows Absolutely. the creation. So, yeah, that explanation is far better than the one they tried uh, to give to Claire to explain what was going on. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And actually, I really liked in this episode how when Claire is looking through this USB on her laptop in, in the diner, that she's being really cagey about it. Like, she's not telling Luke that she's looking through it and, you know, she she really tries to hide that from him. I thought that was really good. And I wondered whether, I think in my notes I said the plot thickens. I wondered whether it was going to kind of drive a wedge between the two of them or, mm-hmm. you know, she would get more suspicious or something like that. But then obviously in the end it, it's all released um down at uh, in, in Georgia yeah. at, at, at birth signs. So I... I liked that moment, though, in the diner. It really was a nice little touch just to see that, you know, she's kind of... Yes, she likes Luke. Yes, she's going to help him. But she's also just trying to find a few things and obviously find out that that the abalone sea creature um, has been used in in the experiment. Interesting, interesting. I wonder if Namor would be happy about that. Oh. Chris. Tying. <laughs> you never know. You never know. The No More Netflix series coming in 2022 or something. 2028, uh, I think. Maybe. Uh, Chris, do you want to give us your next points? Yeah. I'm going to call out something that probably our listeners are screaming. Um, so we brought up a topic in kind of episode one, episode two mm-hmm. of this when we were reviewing it, talking about how, okay, Luke Cage is a great superhero show, but Chio Coker he he's kind of settled this in a real world today type situation and he his belief that a bulletproof black man mm-hmm. is what the world needs right now to showcase some of our current socio economic issues that are going on yeah i'm skirting the issue and i'm just going to dive into it uh-huh. um the scene when luke is walking down the road a hooded black man is walking down the road, not annoying anyone, yeah. in what seems to be an affluent area, yeah. um, and then is pulled over by two cops. Yeah. That is obviously, this was a political raison d'etre, he, or kind of, this was a showcase piece of getting a very topical issue mm-hmm. out in front of millions of people. Mm-hmm. It was just beautifully well done in that he showed both sides, because yeah. I'm saying, so he showed the side where Luke was uh, wrongfully accosted almost, well, it wasn't wrongfully accosted, but because he is a wanted man, but yes. he, hit, he hit one of the cops and then saw that the other cop was going to shoot and then protect the other man, yes. and then he threw them, but the only piece that the media have picked up and are showing is Luke throwing the last cop. Yes. They're not showing the rest of the video. Yeah. So that's one side of the story. Mm-hmm. 
But then he goes further, and probably the writer as well, they show the cop side when Missy's being interrogated in the line of, um, they don't want us, but until they need us. Absolutely. And they'll always give out about us and hate us and fear us. Yeah. Like, and that, that is why I'm very happy with this show mm-hmm. in terms of they're showing both sides. Absolutely. If they had gone one side or the other, you would have got a large proportion of America, depending on which side they fell, mm-hmm. up in arms. But they politically touched on a, a topic that is quite raw mm-hmm. at this point in time. Yes. In a tasteful way. Yeah. In a superhero show on Marvel Netflix or sorry, yeah. on Netflix, but have gone, well, look, there's two sides to every coin. Mm-hmm. You need to look at both. And you as a viewer are shown both. Yes. Yeah. In a t- again, tasteful. And, you know, and also, yeah. it wasn't shoehorned in. This was written into the story where it made sense. Absolutely. There's no, there's no, there's no villainous side shown to the cops. They're not people that are in Diamondback's pocket being sent out to kill Luke Cage or anything like that. These guys are, um, people that see what they think from the back is a vagrant, a drunk person walking down the middle of a street. Um, he's not walking on the, on the, the sidewalk or the pathway, I guess. Um, so, that, that, that does throw up a flag, I presume, for any, any police officer, regardless of race, they're stopping a guy who's walking down the middle of the road who looks drunk. Yeah, that's, that happens all the time. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. At the outset, he has his back to them and his hood up mm-hmm. and his hands in his pocket. So there's no telling whether, um, that person is white, Asian, yep. uh, and, American, black American, or whatever. They just think he's loitering, or yep. maybe he's drunk. Yeah. And walking down the middle of the street, it's a, it's a flag, you know, you've, yep. you've got cars going ba- past every time. You want to get that guy off the road. You, you understand that. Um, the, the flip obviously is that he, that he's asked for ID. Luke realized, Luke, Luke turns to him, obviously wanting to protect his identity and go to, I, goes, do I still need, do I need ID to walk down the street? Uh, this is, Really a clear reference to the biggest, probably, shooting that happened, which was Trayvon Martin, uh, a young kid walking down the street with his hood up, uh, gets shot by police officers for pretty much doing nothing. He's a young kid who had no criminal record whatsoever. The change here, obviously, as you say, Chris, is that Luke Cage does have a criminal re- record. He's the most wanted man in Harlem at the moment. He's on he's on every news station uh, telling you that he's going to be picked up, but it is handled so well, I think, yeah. the scene. Um, as you say, a bulletproof rap, a bulletproof black man in the US at the moment is it is it's such a strong character it's such yeah. a it's such a good commentary on what's going on but they don't skimp on uh, as you say the the uh, the other side of the argument that there are police out there they are trying to save they are trying to protect they are built from different things than I am because I wouldn't uh, go down in the street and and have people shooting at me uh, you know just to help people I don't know it's it's something that I that I'm not built to do that's not my job um but they do this every day and they hate the fact that people hate them constantly until they're needed. It's, it's a really good little other side of the argument. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I think at the balance shown in the show it is really good because I think it, it really needs to have that. I mean, there's part of me that felt slightly uncomfortable seeing absolutely. it, um, it play out just simply because of, you know, it's topical. It's, it's been reported. Um, in the news over here, yeah. um, about what's going on in, in, in the U.S. So it, it's been a big story, both mm-hmm. for the the U.S. but also internationally. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it it did kind of was feel slightly uncomfortable seeing it, but actually it was handled incredibly well. I thought. Um, but the end so. of the end of the scene, the, the the thing that has lasted is the footage that's being shown on television is of a former superhero, a person that is worshipped by the people of Harlem for his super strength, attacking police officers and throwing them away. So again, they are, there is still that commentary there. It's handled really well in the show, and I'm glad it was. It is difficult to watch, but again, it is showing that the media have used this particular section of the video and broadcast that to the wider world. So at the moment, for anybody that's not obviously watching a TV show or the people that exist in this universe in Harlem in this Netflix show, what they've seen is a person they thought was a hero attacking police officers. Yeah. So it is a direct commentary on, what, on what's going on in the real world America. So. 
the the final point on this as well is this, the double sass standard and sexism mm-hmm. in the workplace that yes. Misty calls out. It's a great one in in her interrogation or interview, whatever you want to call it. Definitely, yeah. Like so subtle, I nearly forgot until then. I started thinking back about this and went, "Oh God, yeah." And it wasn't actually even that subtle. Yeah, it was just. Unfortunately, the bias is you. You go, yeah, yeah, that's kind of true. Yeah, yeah, there is a bias there, and it's like, wow, okay. She yeah. just randomly calls it out, and you're like, it, because they don't make such a huge deal about it. It's mm-hmm. not a big, huge topic within for like ten minutes. It's very short. Yeah, to, it's a, it's an off the cuff remark she says back to him. It's kind of swept slightly, but it's still there. Yeah. This actually makes sense of putting it in there. A strong woman in a position of power. Yeah. Two, actually. Both, uh, uh, both Missy Knight and her boss. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they do call out the double standards yeah. of a woman sleeping with someone versus a man sleeping with someone. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, really good point in another, another well handled scene. John, do you want to give us your final point? Yeah. Uh, nature abhors a vacuum. I really love this scene between Mariah and Shades in the morgue. Um, in particular, I just thought Mariah speaking to Cornell under the, whilst he's under the blanket. Um, she did feel remorseful. Felt like it was, she, it was eating at her. Yeah. What she had done. Um, you know, she seemed quite sort of distant, um, while she's kind of touching, uh, his body underneath the, the sheet. And I, I kind of like the way how Shades sneaks in really and hears some of it. And yeah. it's not until the door starts to creak that she, she kind of pulls herself back within herself, uh, and sort of stands up. And I love the fact that here, you know, she, she, um, is being told, she's being instructed here that you are now the business owner of, of this club. You are here to keep Diamondback's clients happy like Cottonmouth did and did so well. And that's why Diamondback at this meeting then of the local crime bosses is, um, you know, ha- and has kind of set up that, you know, he's lost someone who could do his work you know i love the phrase that he uses you die or you buy Mm -hmm. um you know and uh cottonmouth was able to get them to buy yeah (laughs) Uh, and that's what he could do um and mariah has to prove herself here but again it's from shades telling her you need to effectively step up to this plate be strong um and show your worth here um to Diamondback, to well, I think to the local crime bosses. I don't know whether they knew that Diamondback was going to yeah. gate crash the, this this party, but certainly maybe Shades did, but I don't think Mariah did, no. yeah. um, and neither did the other crime bosses either. But I loved her here um, in, in this role, going from the remorseful to the stoic um, to just sort of having to do what she needed to do yeah. really good. Yeah, no, really good, really, really good scene again uh, with Mariah and, uh, and Cotton Myth, definitely. Yeah, um, for me, Mariah's evolution has been one of the most rewarding journeys definitely. of mm-hmm. the season. I, I mean, it just, and again, the performance by uh, Alfie Woodard is just, she shows that depth, I agree, completely. For me, this is just a continuation of the... Netflix tradition, I want to call it, of just setting up and great villainous characters, showing the backstory, yeah. showing their evolution with Wilson Fist, is just out of cottonmouth. Mm-hmm. They've done really well. For me, Mariah is clearly the more villainous antagonist yes. because she is devolving yeah. from this upstanding councilwoman to to her own version of Mama Mabel. Yeah, yeah, to- I totally agree. It's there's something about this character that she was. It's played by Alfred Woodard. I've known her from stuff beforehand, but in the presence of Marshal Ali as Cottonmouth, you were focused on him as being the villain, and she stepped out of that shadow early on, like episode three or so. She was stepping out of his shadow, and you were realizing that there was more to this character. Um, episode four with the flashbacks. Obviously, you were you were seeing um more of the, more of her character as well. Um, but 
if you were, if you had taken Cottonmouth out of this show and had her as the villain, this would be exactly the arc of Wilson, like Wilson Fisk was in Daredevil season one, uh, where he's building up all the way and then suddenly explode and she's out and in the wild. The kind, that kind of arc, you know? Absolutely. And, and we see this several times as well, mm-hmm. where her aide talks about using the death of her cousin to, to, for political advantage and she calls it out on him and he's, to an extent, unsure what she's going to say. And she kind of goes, good, take the rest of the day off. You yeah. know, you've learned a lot. You you know, uh, you're showing your worth to her. Yes. Really good. And then you have effectively her wanting to control the, the media angle on mm-hmm. what's happened. And then you see her use that to convince Diamond back then that she is worth retaining and having around. I, you know... You can come out of the shadows and you can sell to the police. Yeah. Because, again, and she's not just focusing on Luke Cage here. She's actually just going, all of these superheroes who are running around doing their thing and the normal th- scheme of things is all upset uh, and and unbalanced. Mm-hmm. And actually, that reminded me to an extent of kind of Batman and Gotham, that n- that notion that, you know, the, the regular criminals can no longer just simply do the good business that they wanted to do because the, the apple cart has been upset and they've got these superhuman, yeah. superhero enhanced individuals that um, can stop them so much more easily. Absolutely. Um, you know, so it reminded me uh, of the, really of, good. It reminded me of some of the blo- some of the plot of Batman v Superman this year. Effectively, the the whole concept of what do you do when there's a bulletproof person in your city if you can't invent a weapon to kill them and take them out. Um, there's another great bit of commentary. You called out quite a quite a few there earlier on, Chris. But another great bit of commentary here on the drugs industry. I think is what Mariah is commenting on. She's saying uh, create the effectively if you show yourself killing Luke Cage and then also have the bullets to sell to people that want to do the same thing. Um, it's like the drug industry creating the virus and then providing the cure. Uh, that uh, That's another theory that a lot of people have about some of the some of big pharma, that they uh, keep diseases going so that they can make all the money off the back of it, just like some criminals. So that's her suggestion to Diamondback is that he now becomes legitimate by creating a need for something and being the only supplier, and that will give him even more money than he could ever possibly wish for. So I, th- I thought that was quite an interesting piece of commentary. But Chris, do you want to give us your final point? Yeah, I'm going to wrap up my points with, obviously, the, the, the fi- one of the final scenes, which is where we see Diamondback come in and take out all the, the, the gang leaders. Cool, very cool. Yeah. It just, yeah. For me, this felt staged, maybe... I don't know. Was this planned? Like a was setup. It almost like a setup. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Was this planned? Was it not planned? Um, fantastic. One bit I did like the call out that they wouldn't invite the Chinese. Madame Gao is too crazy. Fair yeah. point. Don't well, bring her. They have their own stuff going on in yeah. Hell's Kitchen. I actually thought that was a reference to Dardo, to be honest, and what he was doing down there and taking a lot of the, uh, a lot of the drug, uh, kingpins out but yeah madame guy was the leader of that of that gang so yeah probably don't want her at the table well no because she just picked the knife <laughs> that was thrown to her way and just uh-huh. doing yes it's like nope no no yeah. <laughs> um fantastic showed the the villainous crazy violent side of diamondback and i think it was a fantastic way of just kind of showcasing that yes while he is psychotic and slightly deranged he mm-hmm. has ideas and plans for all of this and he just took out four guys quite quickly without any of their cops oh he took out all their guards as well that's yes. right he said yeah i don't know whether he does have a plan i'm not too sure whether he's just aligned himself with some very good people like shades and then he just goes crazy and just expects it all to be sorted afterwards you know like he, he kind of says i'll kill anyone uh, just come at me, basically. I'll take, I'll take them all out. Um, if anybody has a problem, come at me. I'll take you out. You know, that's, that's constantly his, his mantra. Did any of the four guys actually say anything to him that could have provoked them from, uh, provoked him to shoot them in the head? Because they didn't really. He kind of said the first two don't buy from. The other two that he killed. They were, they were doing a lot of groveling. They were like, definitely, I think they knew their number was up. Yeah. But they were groveling, so you never know. Yeah. yeah. And then last guy that he leaves alive, 
that seems to be just kind of a flip of the coin decision. He says, I have no problem with your friends down south, so I'm not going to kill you. Lucky day, right? Um, doesn't mean tomorrow's not going to be his yeah. lucky day. Well, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> you know. But, uh, but yeah, no, I really like the scene. Again, it, it did strike me like another scene from The Dark Knight with the Joker coming in on the, on the gangs and killing a criminal, uh, as he's, as he walks in. Even he didn't kill four. <laughs> in, a, in a go uh, a little bit like uh, Kill Bill maybe with um, Lucy Liu's character lopping off the head of one of the uh, other heads of the crime families to prove she's the leader I suppose uh, so a little bit like that but um, but yeah yeah it's just for me I find you as you're right is he actually the mastermind mm-hmm. like is he the guy that is that we were led to believe to be the new kingpin yeah to a degree but he doesn't seem it. He just seems crazier. Yeah. He's not as level-headed as Wilson Fisk was, definitely. You feel like he's kind of murdered his way to the top rather than uh, done great business dealings to get there. So he, he's, the what was it, the two, book, the two books he read? The Bible and the 49 Ways to Power? 48 Ways. Yeah. He uh, found the 49th himself. He did. He did. So that's our, that was our book watch for this, for yeah, this episode. Exactly. It's back. <laughs> the Bible. That's it. And <laughs> along with the 48 Laws of Power. Yes, very cool, very cool. My final point, it's got to be the actual Luke Cage in a bath of acid. And well, it definitely. doesn't and it doesn't work. Like this was their last and only plan as he flatlines. What what could possibly be next here? Um is there any is there even any time to set up another experiment to save Luke Cage? I'm the one that keeps speculating that Luke Cage is going to die before the end of the season, even though I know he can't. And we've got Defenders coming up, which we know he's confirmed to be in. So what what else can they do here? They've But maybe it's that moment where he does die from the injuries, but then slowly comes back to life because the regeneration happens. That's very likely, yeah. yeah. Not zombie Luke Cage, but... Marvel zombie starts here. But it, it, oh it, God, it it's that amazing. notion that, yes, he looks dead, but then over the course of a day or two days, it, it his body begins to recover, and then you get the, the beat of the heart starting. And actually, maybe at that stage, the septic wounds have healed. Because, you know, he does have regenerative properties uh-huh. and healing powers. So once he's died... Does that kind of continue a bit like your nose and ears yes. keep on growing? Or is it going to be like they put him in the coffin and then literally a couple of hours later, the dirt seems to rise <laughs> off his coffin? Yes, Superman. Um, oh, okay. Sorry. But, yeah. <laughs> that's been done. They can't, they can't use that. <laughs> can't one. use that but twice. No, I, I think I'm, I'm not sure if it's even going to be days. I think it will be minutes uh, for his recovery after that. Because after that. otherwise... Won't his brain die? So I presume he won't be dead for more than well, a couple, maybe, of, yeah. couple of minutes. And then heart restarted and off he goes again, hopefully. But yeah, I, I, I did shudder at, at the scene, the idea of him going to an acid bath. What Dr. Burston says to him beforehand, you know, how badly can this go, says Luke to him. And he goes, well, the pain of it could be so bad as your skin boils off your body that you might want to put a bullet in your brain. And because you're bulletproof, well, the bullet will probably just bounce off anyway, so you won't be able to do anything about it. it that's that's not good bedside manner from Dr. Burston at all. He just shoved a big needle to the back of his throat. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. That, that was that was fabulous, the puncture of the mucus oh. mm-hmm. membrane. Um, no. Yeah. That looks so difficult. You see, I thought there was a bit more work that was required there, because he, he was trying to get the DNA to see what he needed to do mm. in order to replicate certain conditions, but see how he could almost like back engineer the process. Yeah. Um, whereas the acid bath thing just seemed to be like the first step where it was like, well, let's see if we can soften it up with this acid. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> um, we need to tenderize yeah, the cage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Next, we'll get a big steak <laughs> tenderizer. <laughs> doink, doink, doink. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens now. But I think with that, are there any notes for for this episode? Derek? My first note is seeing the Delphonics on stage in the club. we got another live band mm-hmm. in there. Love the Delphonics. Uh, Didn't I Blow Your Mind This Time? One of my favourite songs. Really, really love that tune. Love seeing them live. The guys are guys have been going for a long time. And it's yeah. just great to see them live in the club. Uh, pretty cool. Pretty cool moment. When they also on the track of... Jackie Brown as well. Yes, they're on the soundtrack with Jackie Brown. Another uh, great, great tune on there as well. So, uh, 
Yeah, yeah, great, great band. Go check them out. Yeah, absolutely. Chris, any notes? No, I've actually strangely used all my notes in this episode. Um, there were some nice callbacks, um, as I said about the Super Soldier being mm-hmm. changed, but um, nothing directly at this point. I've got a couple little other ones, uh, really, which is just, uh, I think, for the Misty Night Netflix show, which will hopefully come. I think her tagline has already been created in this show, which is, I don't seek justice, I stalk it. Oh, perfect. You've just taken one of my notes. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, Well, the final one is just about, again, about Misty. Her description of her night with Luke Cage uh, and their coffee drinking was fantastic. Yeah. I enjoyed that scene as well. Uh, John, do you want to give us your notes? No, you've stolen them all from me. (laughs) I did not mean to steal all your notes. I'm sorry about that. But, Derek, do you defend this episode of Luke Cage? This is an interesting one. This is this is the longest episode, I think, of Luke Cage, and I think they were trying to accomplish a lot. There's a, there's a set of scenes which I think are fantastic, there's, but there's a lot going on in the episode. I'm not sure overall whether um, I defend this episode specifically, but this is a bingeable show. This is a show where you would watch... Three or four episodes. If you weren't podcasting like us, you'd watch three or four episodes back to back. So it probably wouldn't feel like a an overly long episode because you've probably watched two or three hours of the show. So um, so I'm going to defend it. I'm going to say I do defend this episode because there was nothing actually wrong with the episode other than maybe a little bit too much in there um, for this particular one. But Chris, do you defend this episode of Luke Cage? I do, strangely. Um, the last episode, I was very 50-50 with this episode... I'm more 70, 30, 60, 40. Again, yes, the length uh, was a potential issue for me. It feels like they probably pulled parts of scenes from earlier or later episodes and right. trying to just shoot, shoehorn them in to make this an hour and five. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what we're, mi- we're missing some explanations at this point, and as we get further into it, it we're probably not going to get them. But then, with Mariah's evolution, with uh, Shade's secret, whatever that will be, hopefully, um, with the correct introduction of Diamondback, Mm -hmm. and then with Luke's power origin scientifically explained in a plausible way, it makes it, it. These are the big scenes, and then potentially the the biggest reason I really approved of this episode was the skillful way oh sorry i forgot about misty scenes they were brilliant mm-hmm. um but more chio coker's skillful way of bringing in police and all that side of things mm-hmm. bringing in uh shootings yep. and that side of things and then bringing sex sexism in the workplace that for me was skillfully done tastefully done um and a, a commentary on today's society Absolutely. and for that I, that's why I, that knocked it over the line for me. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And another big shout out to Christian Taylor who wrote the episode. Definitely uh, really well handled. Um, so, John, rounding out the group, do you defend this episode? I do defend this episode of Luke Cage. Um, I'd give it 3.5 acid baths out of five. Oh, Bernie. Yeah. But I do think, um, like, I absolutely love the character development um, so far in this sh- in the, in the show. Um, again, for me, standout was with Misty Knight uh, and the the interview with Mariah uh, and Shade's relationship and seeing Shade's relationship now with Diamondback. These are fantastic developments. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the thing is, is that when I first watched this episode, I wasn't entirely sure whether I had enjoyed it or whether there was much to it at the start because... It is quite long. It it is quite drawn out, and I'm not entirely sure to what extent it's carried forward the storyline of um, Diamondback and Luke Cage. Mm. Ultimately, Luke Cage is still wounded and trying to get better, mm-hmm. and he was that in the last episode, and he started out with that in effectively episode seven now, yeah. and. Okay, we've heard some teases in episode eight and a bit more now in episode nine with Diamondback with Luke Cage, but there's nothing concrete. Mm-hmm. Um, 
the development is happening in other characters, and that's great. I'm absolutely enjoying it, as I say, for that reason. But I would like to see um, now a, a good little push um, for for these two characters, yeah. because my concern is is that that is ultimately the ending. That's episode thirteen. So. It's how the other episodes will deal with that. But I do defend this episode because of the great characters of development. Again, I think as Chris has said, how the issue with the police and, and with how women are treated uh, in, in male dominated environments, um, then was really well done. Definitely. Um, and, and has to be applauded. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I do defend this episode, but I do want to see a bit more of a, you know, a little bit more on Stryker and Luke Cage, yeah, to be honest. Absolutely. I really want to see these two come head to head again. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, I, and I'm hoping that the next episode, uh, episode 10, called Take It Personal, I think that episode is where we're going to get the flashbacks to young Willis Stryker and young Luke Cage, and we're going to get that backstory properly laid out for us in that episode, leading us into the last three episodes where there is the battle uh, with Willis Stryker. So, um, really looking forward to that. Thanks so much for joining us, listeners. Really good to have you with us, as always, and thanks for sharing your thoughts. So, on to some feedback for episode nine. Uh, there were some suggestions as to what DWYCK could mean, because uh, I was questioning whether I would know what it would mean in the end. Um, the first suggestion comes from Claire Laffer, who says, Daredevil wants your coffee, Karen, <laughs> <laughs> which I like. That's a pretty, pretty good one. Uh, Claire also suggests, don't worry, yes, Cottonmouth. Kidding. Uh, Cottonmouth <laughs> is now gone in the show, obviously. Good suggestions, Claire. Uh, Jeff Charles uh, also suggested, do what you can, kid. Number of suggestions about that. And uh, in fact, over in the Urban Dictionary, D- uh, DWYCK is actually listed as do what you can, kid. I guess they didn't read the article or the interview with Guru saying uh, that it's not that, it's just Dwick. Uh, so I'm still going with that. He is the artist and there's the person behind it. Uh, it may have come to now mean do what you can, kid, because that's a bit more inspiring than uh, Dwick. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and our last piece of feedback comes in from Robert Phillips, who says, this watching an episode at a time thing is painful now that every episode is ending with the potential death of Luke Cage. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, Robert. That's our fault, isn't it? It's your fault. That's I fault. completely feel your pain too, Robert. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Derek is a harsh podcast editor in this regards to <laughs> myself and Chris. And if you're following along with each of the episodes, um, then, uh, yeah, completely feel your pain. And also, um, you're really going to love the end of this episode. Um, there's a little thing called, or, oh, a massive supernatural thing called Doctor Strange that might get in the way of uh, another Luke Cage release. Mm-hmm. That's uh, very possible. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Robert also has some other points. He says uh, uh, some of the cool things about the episode, Biggie in the mirror and sitting shot to put his crown on the top of Diamondback is a really cool scene. Yeah, it think- definitely reflects uh, what, what happened with Cottonmouth as well. So um, really good. Robert goes on to say, Shades can't be powered and clearly not as important as he would have us believe as he crumbles before Diamondback. I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. There seemed to be a bit of a standoff between the two of them. As I think, as I mentioned earlier on in the episode, him standing up to Diamondback and saying, uh, you don't know who I am, when Diamondback kind of says that to him, feels like there's going to be a bit of a power struggle between the two of them. Yeah, there's certainly um something about Shades that's still not entirely resolved, not entirely uh, stated at the moment um and it may come to something or it may come to nothing but i i really hope it comes to something mm-hmm. and then robert says hearing misty's backstory worrying for her life but no she survived <laughs> good stuff yes absolutely uh, nice to know that yeah. they didn't continue with that little uh that little trick the way through the episodes um question from robert wondering is priscilla the ia head corrupt she keeps pushing badge and gun for one reason only so interesting um i didn't think about that i do feel that she has uh, some connections and she is very high up in in the department she might be more of a pragmatist more of a realist um as you know you move up the chain maybe things you have to balance the political in this case the local councillor elements coming from mariah versus operational and so on and i i do think she's always kind of saying well this is where the evidence leads in the way that i interpret it Mm -hmm. why aren't you going after luke cage he's the one connected to all of these different um 
crimes, activities, deaths, whatever, not Mariah Dillard. Um, but of course, it's it's the gut instinct of, of uh, Misty Knight that's really uh, driving this. Uh, in, in the same way that we, we kind of brought that out on our interview with Justin Swain about him being the forensic and, and the brains and whilst Misty Knight has got the brains as well, she's got that visual gut um, and sensory element to the way she does investigations. So I just think, Priscilla, at this moment in time, there's a little bit of dubiousness about it, absolutely, but I, I think it's more she's trying to just trade off certain things um, from a from a political point of view in Harlem. Yeah, yeah, good points. And the final question from Robert is just asking, is the peer support guy a mirror of Riva? Uh, she's been something before a psychologist and was helping prisoners. Had she been a perp before training up, maybe? Uh, like that guy's an ex-cop. So, um, so this is the peer support guy who's helping out Misty Knight in, uh, in trying to get to the, to the reasons to, uh, why she attacked Claire. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea that possibly, uh, the peer support guy is her version of Riva, the guy, the person that might help her out of, uh, of the situation that she's in, she's in at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I really liked, um, how that all sort of flowed really and i love the fact that he was on top all the time with regards to that that sort of mind battle you know misty knight is hugely mentally strong and yet here is a guy coming in questioning her um her decision making yeah um and that that kind of foundation and so I don't know whether it was so much a support, but maybe she did draw strength ultimately in the end from realizing that she doesn't have to be this, um, top dog all the time. Yeah. She, she can, you know, assert herself and then sort of fade into the background and let others take up the reins. And maybe this was one of the things she was trying to be all things policewoman and detective to, um, all people. Yeah, I totally agree. And as for Misty being a perp before she became a cop, I don't really see it. I see that Misty seems to be someone that has worked through her life to get to where she's gotten to. She feels like a really strong character who probably didn't uh, start off being a criminal and then working her way into the police force. It doesn't feel like that's Misty's journey. Yeah, it, it doesn't feel like that to me either, just at, at, at the moment. Um, but uh, no, that's an interesting points that um, you raise and some really good kind of perspectives on on that whole relationship between yeah. misty and the kind of psychologist yeah absolutely well we are dropping in these uh these pieces of feedback just before we release episode nine of luke cage thanks so much for the feedback if you want to send in your feedback for episode 10 of the podcast our review of take it personal episode 10 of luke cage uh you've got a little bit more time that's a positive way of spinning it isn't it john yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, we will be releasing our review of Doctor Strange, the 2016 movie by Scott Derrickson, uh, to finish off our Fall of Strange, I guess, or Summer of Strange. Yeah. Yeah, or Autumn, Autumn of, strange. of Strange. Yeah. Possibly. Or the Halloween of Strange. Yes, yes. Uh, but we'll be releasing that uh, between now and uh, Friday the 11th of November. And on Friday the 11th of November, we will return to Luke Cage with episode 10, Take It Personal. So I hope you can wait for that one. Yep, so thank you so much for all the comments. Keep them coming in. So I think with that, we will go off to seek justice uh, and stalk it and... Uh, like Misty Knight in the tradition of Misty Knight. So again, it's just to say thank you so much for listening as always. Um, we will be back next time with episode 10, uh, Take It Personal, um, of Luke Cage. So we'll speak with you next time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon. Sweet Christmas. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Defenders TV Podcast, a TV podcast industries production. Our theme tunes provided by the wonderful Mississippi McDonald and the Cottonmouth Kings. If you want to help out the podcast and you've enjoyed listening to us, there's some really easy ways to do it. If you can share our episodes through your social media channels like Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, or Google+, that gets some extra listeners into us. 
If you want to leave us a review on iTunes or a rating, just leave a five-star rating, click the button, or go to iTunes through DefendersTVPodcast.com slash iTunes. We'll take you straight to our page and leave us a review or a rating there. That always helps out independent podcasts. And also, as always, we love to hear your feedback about the show's interaction with our audience is what we really, really love. So you can send us feedback to feedback at DefendersTVPodcast.com. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.